I'm Rosie Head. I'm one of the two new chairs of History and Theory here at the Architectural Association. Um, and I'm delighted that you could join us this evening for this discussion between Kenneth Frampton and Daniel Telesnik um, for the launch of their uh, new book, Kenneth Frampton Conversations with Daniel Telesnik, um, published by Columbia University. Daniel Telesnik is a lecturer in architecture and civil engineering at the University of Bath. He's an architect from the Catholic University of Chile in Santiago and holds an MSc and PhD from Columbia University. He also worked at the Architecture Museum at TUM in Munich for five years, where he curated Access for All, Sao Paulo's architectural infrastructures and Who's Next, Homelessness, Architecture and Cities. And although I'm sure Kenneth Rampton needs little introduction to this audience tonight. He's an architect and a hugely influential historian, theorist, and critic. The writer of numerous essays and books on modern and contemporary architecture. He trained as an architect here at the AA during the 50s, and I believe taught here as well in the 60s. And it's wonderful to have him back um, as he's been based in the US for such a long time, although I've just found out tonight that he actually moved back to the UK last year, which is great news. Um, he taught at Princeton and then uh, Columbia, where he was Ware Professor at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. So the book comprises seven interviews that took place between Kenneth and Daniel um, over the course of two years between 2011 and 2013. And as Daniel states in his introduction, they form an entangled and discursive map of Frampton's life and ideas that is much about Frampton himself as about the cultural environment from which his work emerged. The interviews span his diverse life and career as a practicing architect, technical editor of architectural design, his teaching in the US and the UK, and his involvement in the transatlantic intellectual discourse from the 60s onwards but also the influence of other uh, semesters teaching in other countries and institutions, such as the Balaga Institute in Amsterdam and the Academia di Architettura in Mendrisio. What's so exciting for me about this book is that it doesn't read as a chronology um, of his extraordinary life's work, but rather as an expose of him as a thinker, a foray into a deep cultural consciousness it's a mix of personal reflection and the entanglement of the people, the places, and the politics through which his ideas came into being. The book reveals the intricacies of sculpting architectural ideas and his unique consideration for social and political conditions, the phenomenology of architecture, as well as its formal and structural qualities. Through some discussions about some of his key works, including his book, Modern Architecture, A Critical History, and some seminal ideas such as critical regionalism and tectonic culture. The book also includes an essay by Mary McLeod, who's a professor at Columbia University, that examines his use of the term critical within his architectural writing, elucidating a certain type of knowledge that's active in its transformative power and potential. In the lineage of Marx, Marcuse, and Benjamin, architecture as an art of resistance. And indeed, criticality is very active within the pages of this book. So it's been 10 years, over 10 years, 12 years, since the last interview was carried out. And Daniel's idea this evening was that this is a, a live interview um, that would form, in a way, the eighth chapter or an epilogue to this series of conversations. So it's with great pleasure that I hand over to Kenneth and Daniel to which the witness the critical in action tonight. Thank you. Okay, the, the critical in action, well, we hope we can live up to that phrase. Uh, yeah, but there's a considerable embarrassment, I think, in the book with this title and being present at a public presentation of it because uh, it's a bit of a closed circuit and uh, it could be seen as a kind of um, very unfortunate uh, experiment in of a self, somewhat self-indulgent kind, but fortunately Daniel is at the table with me, so I feel, you know, uh, yes, I, I, I feel, you know, uh, re reassured to some extent. And his name, of course, is also on the cover of the book. 
And the one thing that I'm very happy about is the graphics of the cover, uh, you know, because we struggled for a long time with the unfortunate graphic designer to get a result as good as this. So I'm kind of uh, very happy about that. Uh, the cover above all, <clears throat> you can't judge a book by its cover, of course, we know that. But uh, uh, maybe one should just stop with the cover and I could also stop with this um, dialogue. In any case, um, I'm only beginning the dialogue because I'm, hopefully Daniel will be soon part of the dialogue and I will, it can be a dialogue as opposed to a monologue. Uh, yes, well, I'm, well, what I think is amazing, and I uh, is is the fact that interviews are often, uh, or, well, one singularly or in plural, they are often rather uh, unfortunate. I think in terms of the the result, I I have given at different times interviews with uh, different figures. And uh, sometimes, in fact, just before I left New York in uh, May, the beginning of May of this past year, um, I had an interview with two colleagues and a transcript was uh, sent to me after that. And I thought that the entire interview was um, yeah, total, total chaos and total nonsense. And uh, I express myself on this to the two figures involved and they didn't agree with me, of course, but I remain very doubtful about its merits. So interviews can have very unfortunate um, consequences, I think. And um, speaking from my, own ex you know, from my own experience, I just think that they, they uh, often don't work very well. And uh, it depends, of course, on two figures always. The, the interviewer and the interviewee. And I'm not sure I'm a kind of a, um, natural interviewee, so to speak, but the interviewer can often save the day. And in this case, I think what uh, Daniel uh, is, Daniel Stolesnik is a particularly good interviewer, or at least I think that this book uh, has its vitality and its uh, liveliness because of the interviewer you know i think the interviewer was was able to to bring out you know stimulate me in some way or other that allowed the results to be have a very fluid and uh, uh, lively character and that is maybe the most important virtue of the book altogether and um and so uh, of late, uh, not so recent, but fairly recent, uh, Daniel uh, reminded me that the, uh, of a um, Latin American colleague who, uh, in fact, comes from Colombia, whose name and who, who also has has taught in in in, in Colombia, and uh, and and uh, his name is Enrique Walker, and uh, Daniel maintains that it's Henry. Enrique Walker, who uh, sort of magically gave to him this kind of skill of, uh, of knowing how to interview people. And, um, well, I think, uh, I think the, the book itself is a proof of that uh, capacity. And uh, I feel very privileged to have uh, had, had this opportunity. And uh, it wasn't my idea to publish the book, the book also has um, uh, an essay about the critical vis-a-vis -vis myself um, uh, by Mary McLeod, who is a very, very stimulating teacher, a uh, very extremely generous person who, uh, you know, this is an essay that Mary wrote for uh, another publication for a so-called Festrift. Um, that has been out for a while. And, uh, but it, it is, a, of course, about the critical and my kind of somewhat pathological obsessions with that word. And uh, subtitled Kenneth Frampton's idea of the critical. Don't ask me to expand on that. Uh, except I want to end with one thing, which is this question of uh, 
No, there's no doubt that I was very influenced, and I, you know, I guess I still am very influenced by uh, what used to be called the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. And uh, that's to say, of course, by Adorno, Adorno, Horkheimer, Dialectics of the Enlightenment, and by uh, Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, which is really a truly astonishing book, which I think that all uh, students of architecture or culture in general should read, Eros and Civilization. And um, so there, uh, as uh, someone uh, long ago said to me, with regard to philosophy, you know, one's either a Frankfurter or a French fry, and I am definitely a Frankfurter, and uh, hence the, the, the hang up on the word critical. So with that, I will pass the conversation over to Daniel, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you very much, uh, Ken, and all of you for, for being here today. Uh, I might start by saying that our mutual friend Enrique, who happens to have a PhD from the AA, would have been pleased with being remembered today. And the anecdote that I told in New York was that when I reached out to him to say, I'm going to do this project of interviews with Ken, I said, how do you, how do, you do it? And he said, just read the truth of Hitchcock and you, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so I want to thank uh, Ingrid. For, for the invitation, Manija and Harriet for, for being so welcoming, Rosie for her words, the people in the bookshop, of course, and uh, to the whole team in Colombia that made this book possible. There's a big story to it. We had it, we lost it, we engaged with it again. So I guess for us, it's a, kind of a triumph to see the book in print. Without further ado, I will start uh, this eighth interview to Ken. <laughs> and uh, since I, I, I've called this part back in London. So basically, as you tell in the book, after, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes, okay. After a year at the Guildford School of Art, you transferred here to the AA. And this is basically where you started out your life as an architect. You studied during the first year of the Department of Tropical Architecture under Jane Drew and Maxwell Fry, and also met some of your best friends here. So how does it feel to be back in the building? Well, it feels a bit unreal. Uh, you know, it's such an, uh, I'm so familiar with this place. Uh, I, uh, I studied here, of course, as you said, but also uh, I, I've been back, uh, you know, numerous times, and uh, during different um, <coughs> directorships, so to speak. <coughs> and I once was a candidate for <coughs> uh, the, the, becoming the director of the school, which never happened, and uh, because uh, out, you know, the, the political nature of the A, which is also, I think, a very unique and surprising thing, that uh, it has its own kind of political uh, uh, tradition. Uh, probably it's unique from that point of view, I think, that, um, that major decisions are made about leadership of the place, often, in any case, in the past, uh, in which, uh, you know, the entire community of students and I think even other figures vote uh, on the question of the rival candidacies, for example, for the position. And that, that is pretty, that, that's kind of very unique, I think. And, um, well, it's a sort of, a, it, it's a kind of a subterranean aspect of the house that is pretty remarkable. And um, so uh, there was once here in this very hall, I suppose, a, a uh, rival presentation on, on the part of myself and Alvin Boyarsky. And, uh, and when I th look back, and there is a record of it, you know, what I envisaged, uh, what I kind of naively put forward as a, as a, 
Our educational program, I mean, was quite reasonably defeated, I think, you know. Uh, extraordinary, naive uh, little document. In any case, it's fortunately buried in the archives, but it's still, I think, one could find it. <clears throat> I don't even have a copy. It's so embarrassing, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I've been back in this house so many times, I, and also particularly during uh, Alvin's uh, leadership and also Moisson's leadership. So uh, it's a very familiar house to me, and and now also under uh, Ingrid Schroeder, uh, you know, I, it's a very comfortable place, uh, extraordinary, I think, and. Um, so that's one aspect of being back. And uh, the, the other aspect is that uh, maybe it can put a, be put another way, which is that, um, yeah, I think I spent, what, the best part of my life in, in New York. And that was, uh, yeah, it was a very extremely uh, stimulating place to live, et cetera, et cetera, and work. And uh, I, you know, it, it was a very rich part of my life. But I always had this feeling, which I'm sure other people have experienced, of maybe not so often, because it can be, it has two aspects. One, of course, is to be in exile, uh, because one has no choice. And the other is to be what I, I sometimes used to tell myself, uh, self-imposed exile, you know. That's a very strange, uh, uh, yeah, it's a strange psychological condition, I think, uh, of, of being someone who chooses to not live where they, not live in the place of their origin, you know, uh, for various reasons, of course. And uh, so that, that is, um, the, well, the, the point of it is that uh, I don't feel that anymore, I came back. <laughs> So, so, uh, and it's a very pleasurable feeling to, uh, yeah, to feel, uh, in, in, you know, back in the place, in black in the place of one's origin, and uh, and particularly, of course, the A is a place of my origin, and um, uh, all of that is a great pleasure. Did you ever teach here? Only very briefly. Very, very briefly. I mean, mainly as a kind of adjunct uh, critic. Yeah. You left New York last year, as Rosie told us, and moved back here after almost 50 years, right? Mm. And you left a very central apartment in New York for a flat in the Barbican Center. Mm. And I was thinking that the Barbican, although already in construction, when you left mm. England, mm. Uh, it wasn't really inaugurated until 1982, I believe. Mm. So in a way, uh, you are living in a part of London that is also new for you. Is yeah. that the case? Yes. The, the strange thing about that is that I once worked in the office of Chamberlain, Powell and Bond, um, who were the designers of the Barbican. As, and um, so they just received that commission from the city of London. When I, wor I worked one summer in that office, and uh, they, they had had also won the uh, Golden Lane competition. So, uh, in that office for one summer, I produced some stupid little drawing for a, a fragment of the Golden Lane scheme, which is actually and actually got to be built. You know, that's the wild thing. I can <laughs> take a, a walk. Uh, uh, you know, from the Barbican to Golden Lane, and I can look at this thing and think, well, it's unbelievable. They they built it exactly the way I drew it. You know, it's a very strange feeling. <laughs> yeah. But also the, the type of architectural complex like uh, living, right, in the Barbican, mm. which I don't think you had experienced before. No. Can you comment on this? Well, you know, it, it, I think what is a great achievement and unique about it is it is a city in miniature, you know. And uh, in fact, I think Colin Rowe at some point made some kind of comparison between the Barbican and the Palais Royal in Paris, which is hardly uh, 
not too convincing, but but um, uh, but it is a city in miniature, and and uh, unique, I think. Uh, well, it's certainly unique uh, in this country, but fairly there are not too many cities in miniature. I've always thought of the Rockefeller Center as a city in miniature, but the the big issue in the case of Rockefeller Center, as opposed to the Palais Royal, is nobody lives there, and and. Uh, that's a huge difference, I think. Um, I mean, the Rockefeller Center otherwise, you know, has all the attributes of a city in miniature. If you think of the, uh, the, the very large auditorium that, it, well, all students should, finish, should definitely go and see this auditorium. I mean, it, it kind of embarrassed, you know, I'm kind of ashamed of the fact that we didn't insist when, all these years of teaching in Columbia, that you know, first-year students should all go and see this auditorium, because it is it is an unbelievably spectacular space, and uh, yeah, incredible achievement of uh, Harrison and Fuller, who incredible work. We we recently had a chance to visit High Point one and two together, mm. uh, a memorable day really. And interestingly enough, neither you nor Robin Middleton, who was with us that day, had ever mm. been inside the buildings. Um, that day we commented something along the lines that modern architecture before the war in London was a high-end middle-class housing, right? And that after the war it became an effective way of infilling bombed sites and getting the quotas of needed housing units, mm. but it never reached its pre-war sophistication, if you will. And I must confess that reading Edward Jones and Christopher Woodward's Guide to the Architecture of London, mm. I, I could confirm that they make basically the same point. Mm. Um, on, on one hand, uh, and besides the proper budget for this project, which was a commission from Sig Sigmund Gestetner, and yeah, originally right. intended to house um, stuff right. from his company. Yeah. This relates to the Georgian emigre Bertolt Lubitkin, yeah. his refinement as an architect and his uncontested pre-war standing as mm. basically a leading modern architect in Britain. And on the other hand, on what happened with modern architecture in general after the war, not only in Britain. Have you given this more of a thought since we went there? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I actually once uh, tried to work for Skinner, Bailey, and Lubeckin. That wasn't, I was thrown out. But uh, um, nothing happened. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, Lubeckin before the war was, was, I think, very clear, you know. And uh, after the war, because he, he, uh, he shifts his ideological position, because he starts to become. Not, not immediately after the war, but later. I think there is a, in the Architectural Association Quarterly, there is um, an article, or I think even two articles by Lubetkin, that in, in effect are appreciations of Stalinist social realism. And, uh, and that aspect of Lubetkin is kind of surprising. I mean, uh, I think they're sort of, 19, these, are, these two essays are 1956. And uh, um, and if you think of the work of uh, Lubeckin after the Second World War, it's extremely decorative, you know, compared to the pre-war period. And uh, you know, this kind of slightly, almost sort of geometrical obsession with sort of you could say called a quasi Aztec, Aztec uh, monumental. Um, Formalist uh, skins to the buildings, you know, to the to the housing that Lubeckin designed immediately after the war, and uh, I think that already is is the beginning of his uh, um, recognition of the problem of the accessibility of the language of the modern movement, you know. Uh, I mean, it, it probably also relates to his. Um, Related to his uh, his identification with the with the with the Russian Revolution, in fact, and I I once had this experience in the British Museum with um, Camilla Gray and uh, 
German filmmaker called Lutz Becker, who lived here for a long time, who's gone back to Germany, um, and Lubeckin. And Becker had uh, recovered uh, film, uh, films of the revolution. And uh, so in the basement of the British Museum, there were the three of us looking at films of the revolution. I mean, footage taken during the revolution. And uh, Lubeckin started to cry. You know, so um, totally overwhelmed by the sight. So Rebekin, I think emotionally was uh, very connected to the to this idea of social revolution. Um, I I know, I know that you oh you haven't finished sorry no I have ah <laughs> um, I I know that you're coming to this building. I, I don't know how often, but mm. at least we've met here a couple of times. So I'm thinking yeah, that's a habit, th right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was wondering, um, yeah. what other what other buildings in in London do you see yourself, let's say, attracted to or drifting towards, if you will? I've heard you praise the Brunswick Center many times. Yeah, right. Do you go and see it often? Well, I, uh, um, Brendan Woods, who's sitting there right in front of me, lives in the Brunswick, so I do occasionally. Um, yes. We, I'm occasionally invited to Brenda's apartment, so I do go. And there's also the cinema, you know. Right. Um, uh, what is it? The latest film there is Zone of Interest, which I, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, quite something, that film. But um, it's very disturbing. But, yeah, I mean, I do go there. I mean, it is a remarkable work, I think. And... Um, Yes, I, I wrote uh, the little essay which has never been published, with, with not not adequately anyway, with its title "Mega Form as Urban Landscape," and the the, the Brunswick features rather prominently in that um, uh, essay, because and and the maybe it's necessary to to try to explain what what is what is the thesis of the essay because um, part of the part of the, I think well the basic argument is that um, that the megalopolis which is and well I suppose on on its periphery London becomes a megalopolis and uh, but there are megalopoli all over the place of course with uh, there are 30 million populations you know populations far in excess of national states and um, Mexico City being exactly one. And uh, all of which, of course, is a product of the automobile. Uh, without the automobile, of course, none of that would ever have happened. And, and um, it's also, of course, a, a product of uh, the, um, yes, the neoliberal idea that one doesn't need to plan anything. You know, certainly not cities, and um, uh, so that um, the, this idea of mega form, as opposed to mega structure, is that uh, is the possibility of certain programs being um, built or conceived in such a way as they establish a, a uh, coherent uh, mic microcosm. You know. Um, And uh, the Brunswick is like that, I think. Uh, it, it, uh, it's definitely a place apart, you know, it's definitely a bounded domain. And uh, I think that that's uh, uh, among its real virtues, you know, uh, at, a, at a big conceptual level. I mean, of course, it, it, it is extremely interesting architecturally and in terms of the quality of the apartments and all these other factors. But the overriding thing is it's kind of world apart. And uh, yes, and therefore, you know, a megaphone. And, and uh, at least uh, this is the argument I, I have tried to advance. How about the building you designed in Bayswater, Corn oh, well, Home Gardens? <laughs> do, do you ever go and see it? No, I have seen it, yes. I mean, I do occasionally. Uh, go there and uh, 
Yes, I mean, it's amazing. The, the, the garden, which is part of, uh, you know, the trees have greatly advanced, of course, since I last was living here. And uh, therefore, they have even more privacy than they had before. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a pleasure to go and see it, but except for the fact that they painted all the railings black, as opposed to the gray that they ought to have been, but oh, they were once, of course, also. Any, any new buildings in London you appreciate? I have heard you praise the new buildings by the Irish practice Grafton, like the Kingston Town Hall and LSE's Marshall Building. Can, yeah. can you tell us about these? Well, I've not been to the Kingston, so I know of it in uh, images, but I don't know it in reality. I, I think the, the amazing thing about the Marshall Building is uh, the ground floor. Well, the structure altogether is amazing because they, this very kind of uh, bold structure on the, on the ground floor, which creates the public space, the public foyer of the building, which I think is a fundamental aspect of it, then rotates, very ingeniously rotates, so as to, um, uh, rotates and scales down so as to support the offices that, that are above. Uh, I think it's a very in, ingenious use of structure and, and also, the organization of the space and the structure together are very compelling. Um, I, I mean, I do have some uh, reserve about the problem of, uh, of um, yes, the kind of Brisolai elevations seem to me to be uh, not their best. Well, Grafton, I mean. And, um, but, they're, but they're extremely good architects. Which brings me, of course, to the whole topic of Irish architecture, which is uh, just extraordinary, I think, what the Irish have been able to create over the last 20 years is really quite outstanding. The other thing I, I experienced last night for the first time is a, is a new Sadler's, Sadler's Wells uh, auditorium, well, the whole thing, which I was told was designed by Nicholas Hare, and uh, it's extremely impressive work, I think. It's, it's, um, it has a kind of uh, a Bain uh, considering and um, yeah, it's, it's a really, I think, remarkable, relatively recent, I suppose, British modern building. Where are we going now? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to new publications. Do we still have some time to keep mm. on talking? Yeah. Um, some months ago, you told me you were considering writing a book about architects' aphorisms and mentioned one in particular, um, Adolf Loss, saying that, I quote, changes in the traditional way of building are only permitted if they are an improvement. Otherwise, stay with what is traditional mm. for truth, even if it be hundreds of years old, has a strong inner bond with us than the lie that walks by our side. Um, do you want to comment on this aphorism and its relevance, and if you have followed up with this project? Well, I mean, I think I only know, to be honest, the shorter version, which is there is no point in inventing anything unless it's an improvement, you know. And uh, uh, I, I think it's a terrific aphorism. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm rather keen on aphorisms altogether, and I, I knew that you were going to bring this up. Um, I, I think it would be unbelievable if one could actually give birth to an aphorism, but I've never managed to do that. <laughs> and, um, but unlike Alvaro Ziza, who is a master of aphorisms, actually, and we were talking about it, and I know you have it in the script there, that, um, I love this one aphorism I think is just amazing, which is um, the idea is in your head, not in the in the sight. I think he actually says the idea is in your head. No, sorry, the other way around. I'm getting totally confused about this. The idea is in the sight and not in your head. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an unbelievable aphorism. I think he says actually the idea is in the rock and not in your head. Uh, um, yeah, that, that is a master of aphorisms that are pertinent to architects. 
Um, yeah. I, I was going to follow up that uh, with, with asking you if you're ever going to write more at length about CISA and how central he has become for your, well, how, how interesting he is for you, basically. You know, the very fascinating thing about him is he wants to be a sculptor. And uh, I think that it's a, a very uh, prominent uh, element in the work. You know, the work is, is definitely a work of architecture. It's not, uh, um, it's not, uh, it's not a, you know, attempting to be big art, unlike some people that, we, that are, uh, are prominent in the field. And, but, um, but you, you know, in, in looking at the work, you, you have to uh, be aware of the sculptural aspects, I think. You know, the, there, is a, there is that dimension in the work, which is, I think, quite powerful. And obviously relates to this ambition of his youth, where he, where he of course, ironically says, you know, my parents, of course, my father thought that was going to be a very profitable way of life. Um, so, of course, uh, as must be true for uh, many other figures who end up uh, being architects as opposed to artists. Um, yes. But, I mean, the other aphorism of his I, I greatly admire is uh, architects don't invent anything. They transform reality. I mean, I think that that is just also credible. Uh, you know, I mean, his aphorisms always have a kind of ironic uh, edge to them, but that gives them their power, I think. You know, and um, well, he's not the only uh, master of aphorisms, but uh, he's certainly one who's important to me. You know. Last week we were here talking about microcosms. You mentioned that um, you're going to guest edit one of the numbers of this new magazine about philosophy and, yeah. and architecture, and that that's going to be the rubric you're going to invite authors to to work on. Mm. Um, wh when we when we talked about this book in New York, uh, mm. you mentioned that that for you microcosms represent what architects actually have a chance of doing to create microcosms through mm. buildings and designed infrastructures at large where people can find both spiritual and mm. physical shelter, mm. places of both tranquility and vitality. Mm. Following an aphorism by Luis Barragan, the mm. Mexican architect, when he won the Pritzker Prize, when he said, an architecture that does not achieve tranquility fails in its mission. Mm. Can you develop this idea further, how this concept of microcosms ex encapsulates in a way what you think about architecture and what should ideally point what should architecture, architecture ideally point toward? Mm. Or how can it contribute to people oh, in, right. our, in our current day societies? Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, uh, yeah. it's interesting because the uh, two figures that were here, the, um, uh, Peta, who's, to be honest, whose last name I can't remember, uh, um, said to me, um, in dinner after the uh, dinner after the the public event, that you know he mentioned the word project, you know, that he was interested in the idea of the project, and uh, I thought afterwards, and it's still on my mind, you know, that maybe the word project is uh, a more important word than the word microcosm, and or or let's say more optimistic word than the word microcosm. Uh, and therefore, I'm not sure anymore whether I would uh, stick with microcosm or um, um, you know, take over his idea of project. And the reason for this is, well, the reason for both, because I think vis-a-vis -vis optimism and a certain level of uh, pessimism uh, is that um, that the, you know, approaching the issue of architecture and philosophy under, well, approaching the issue of architecture and philosophy altogether is a challenging uh, prospect. But uh, 
if, if one's trying to uh, do that under one single word, then I think, uh, um, I, or I have to recognize the fact that why did I choose the word uh, microcosm? And I think because I thought that, um, that it, it, it's important that uh, architects can make or should wish to make microcosms. Because um, given the way things are, given the, um, what Habermas Frankfurt School again uh, calls the unfinished modern project, uh, you know, probably uh, it's perhaps destined in, in, from, from his point of view or, uh, to be perennially unfinished. And from, from, that, from that standpoint, microcosm is in lieu of the unfinished modern project. But what I mean is that um, buildings large and small can be conceived as microcosms in which the, the effort is to, to create for the society um, spaces in which one can realize, the society can realize itself. And um, that's why I've always uh, um, been obsessed with, in a way, uh, Hannah Arendt's term, space of human appearance. I think that that is fundamental to architecture, that, uh, that the microcosm should provide the space of human appearance. I think it's fundamental. And, and that, that idea of the space of human appearance has both a political and a, uh, existential uh, meaning for me. And I, I dare say also for her. And um, so that's one aspect of microcosm. And I, and I, I associate it, you know, thinking out loud with that it might be considered to have a certain, certain pessimistic dimension. And the word project is, is opposite, I think. It has an op optimistic dimension. And talking of pessimism and optimism, I once have this exchange with Alvaro Zita because I hear that he has a lot of work. And he says, um, yeah, I, I write to him, you know, congratulating him on, on that fact. And he writes back to me a little note which says, um, yeah, it's true, I have a lot of projects. Oh, I know, that's what I say. I say to him, you must be happy to have you know, you must be happy to have uh, these projects, a lot of work. And he says, uh, it's true, I have a lot of projects, a lot of work, but I'm not happy. How can one be happy when Europe has no project? I, I find that, I, I'll never get over that uh, statement, I think, because it, it is a kind of political statement. And, and I think the, the, uh, no, no question is a political state. And I think the uh, disturbing thing about this particular moment in history is there's a lot of political leadership all over the place where the figures in question don't have any projects. And this is very discouraging state of affairs, I think. There's no project. You know. So I think maybe I'm, taught, I'm torn between is it microcosm or is it project that one should, that should be the word? Okay, anyway. Yeah, um, I, I suggest we leave, it, we leave it at that and we open to questions of the floor now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, hi. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually have one building off that last point that you were just making. Um, I think in my line of work, I'm quite interested in the interplay between, uh, I think as we all are at some point in our lives, the relationship between capital and the state. And I'm curious if you think that capital alone has the potential to drive towards a project in the way that you were just articulating, or whether it does need to be something that's 
predominantly state-led. And I'm curious, you have a historical take on that as well, not just a contemporary one. Thanks. Yeah, well, I, 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 I think it has to be state-led, or, or it depends what one means by the state. I, I, I become interested uh, recently in the, uh, yes, the Latin idea of the city-state as, as opposed to the state. And um, I, I, yes, what got me into this is uh, Chantal Mouffe uh, in her um, essay on agonistics uh, talks about um, Massimo Conchari's idea very positively of federation from the bottom. And Massimo Conchari was the, Ven the mayor of Venice twice. And I recently had an exchange with someone came, whose name is Enrique Penaloza, who was, as it happens, mayor of Bogota twice, who has uh, uh, He's about to produce a book, I think it'll come out in April, on the idea of the city, uh, the importance of the city, in terms of, um, and, and, and why do, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all very naive, but why do I have this interest in the city-state? Because, uh, you know, uh, uh, participatory democracy has its limits, and one realizes it most intensely, of course, in relation to the Anglo-American predicament, you know, where you, where you have two parties in both countries. And these two parties, you know, are playing a game with each other to gain a certain percentage of the vote so they can go to power, you know. So they can, of course, they don't know what to do with the power other than facilitate um, neoliberal, um, maldistribution of wealth, but um, uh, but I think that, that that's the limitation. And, and somewhere, uh, everyone knows, of course, that I'm kind of totally, uh, or I have been totally sort of obsessed with Hannah Arendt, but somewhere Hannah Arendt says, power remains with the people as long as they live together, you know. And, uh, and I think of the city-state as the people living together, you know, and as opposed to the abstraction of participatory democracy, where, you know, it's just a, a roulette game with the voters to, you know, somehow or other so confuse the issues that nobody knows quite what they are voting for anymore. You know, where, where these two, particularly in the two-party systems, you know, where the, they're kind of, uh, you know, they, 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 they play a game in which they look alike, of course, almost alike. I, w I was going to say that you were already interested in this idea of the city-state in a way before when, when you became interested in uh, Ungers and Köln and uh, Sisa and Porto and all these combinations of architects and singular cities yeah, when you were right. the... Yeah, right. Not that they were perhaps uh, administrative yeah. autonomies, but yes, culturally autonomous well, in a way. It, it, I suppose it relates to this uh, other hang-up about critical regionalism. But um, actually, you know, when uh, in this br brief period, which I, uh, I regret it was so brief, which is entirely my own uh, fault, um, uh, I remember Joseph Rickward uh, making me aware of the the career of Gino Valli in relation to the town of Udine, you know. And, uh, and, and it's, it's then I thought, you know, in the, this is in the beginning of the 60s, you know, ab about, uh, well, I, st I started, well, many things at the same time. One is that Monica Pigeon, whom I worked with, you know, was very preoccupied with the fact that, uh, um, uh, you know, in the post-war period, the Germans have built theaters all over the place in provincial cities in Germany. And I, I stuck in my head, you know, I try to think, would the British do that? You know, I, I thought, it's not, 
that, that's not conceivable. And, and, and uh, I mean, in other words, and I think it has to do also, by the way, with the, in the German case anyway, with the late formation, the late unification of Germany. Because the, the cities which are finally unified by Bismarck, you know, are, have, their own, have their own idea of culture. And therefore the theater as a, as a, as a building form, you know, relates to that, that identity of the city, I think. And you know, the, the British never, never really, uh, they never really developed the city in the same way, I don't think. There, there are exceptions, of course, but, and, and finally, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, Margaret Thatcher destroyed the British provincial city without categorically, for political reasons. And, um, so th th that's an issue involved, you know, that comes to mind about the question of the city state. And, um, and so you, you, Daniel reminded me just now, you know, that, that um, it, it was a total fantasy, of course, but, well, total, maybe not total, but anyway, partly a fantasy to think that I, I thought of certain architects that they had a particular relationship to the city, you know, and uh, the, uh, among these architects was Ernst, uh, Matthias Ungers in relation to Cologne, uh, Gino Valli in relation to Udini, Ernst Kiesel in relation to Zurich, you know. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, this perhaps was, you know, a, a projection, I suppose I want to say. It was a projection, perhaps, rather than something that was real. But uh, it's on my mind. It has been, you, as you rightly point out, something I... I've been a bit hung up about for quite some time. You mentioned that you you are longing for a project which you feel at the moment is either not there or mm. hard to grasp. Mm. Um, I was wondering what for you um, many years ago when you were studying, or soon after you were studying, you were practicing in, as an architect. Mm. Uh, what was your project? And it was a period when Le Corbusier was very important, and it was at, maybe at the center of a British architectural education in some ways. And I, want, I was wondering, for instance, whether Le Corbusier may have had something to do with it, and I would like to know also if there was such a project, um, whether you think this project succeeded or not. Yeah. Yes, well, I, um, part, part of this rests with the, uh, the term modern movement. Uh, actually, that, that term is first used by Otto Wagner. Moderna Bewegung in, uh, in his uh, 1897 movie, I guess. And, uh, but, uh, you know, my memory of being here as a student is that we, meaning my fellow students, but also the place, somehow, uh, it was never defined, but the idea of a modern movement, we, we were, I think we thought we all were part of the modern movement. So there is a project of course, um, yeah, it's a project lying there, you know, in, in that phrase, I think. And um, so, certainly, Le Corbusier was part of, you know, was a central figure, I think, and the overcomplé, you know, was, was a, like a sort of fundamental ref point of reference and was always meant to be. And, and, uh, um, Yes, yeah, so I think you know, well, he wasn't the only influence, but certainly he was a very strong influence, I think, on British work and on work inside the AA and so on. Um, and uh, I suppose on myself also, yes. But the other, the other uh, if, if one can talk in terms of uh, um, uh, language, you know, uh, yes, kind of. Uh, 
architectonic language, then I think also the Russians were important to me, you know. And uh, this, this um, mostly, of course, just projects, unrealized works that were published first, of course, by Ar Architecture Vivante in, 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 in Paris, but, you know, uh, were, were more and more available, particularly in the uh, 60s. And that surely was an influence, I think. Um, so this this um, building, in, which is in Bayswater, which was um, which were you know which I worked on, well, uh, yeah, on, on I suppose virtually every part of it. Um, I had that privilege, you know. I was. Uh, it was an incredible privilege. I, 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 how could I not realize how unique it was? You know, that I managed to work on that building and get it built. Uh, and I was 30 years old. You know, I just can't. I, I don't really. I. I don't really have. I, I find it hard. You know, how did I deserve to, to, to have this kind of accident? But anyway, uh, I. That was a, you know, a great pleasure. And, and a kind of fulfillment in a way. And, but if you look at the building, you can see that it, it is um, it's partly influenced clearly by Le Corbusier, but it's also influenced by Russian constructivist uh, language. And, um, and so that brings up the, the, well, the one thing I want to say is that, that um, and Edward Jones, who is here, was at some point part of this uh, brief, uh, unbelievable moment when uh, the figure of Douglas Stephen, who has long since not been part of this world, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, was, was an incredible risk-taking architect who employed young people uh, and let them get on with it, basically. You know, uh, he, of course, washed over their shoulders, but I mean, basically, he was an extraordinary figure. So this, this, this is kind of a bit too rambling, I think, and I should just stop. But um, maybe I haven't yet answered your question even, but I, I'm trying to get there. Hi, hi there. Um, I recently read something by you where you said something along the lines of um, architects have more to learn from landscape architects or mm. landscape, and uh, would love to hear more about that. Mm. Well, it's also a bit related to uh, my idea of megaform in relation to the megalopolis. You know, if you think of the, of the scale of the megalopolis, which is not a city, um, what can you do with it, basically? I mean, it's, it's already been made. It's, 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 uh, it's in a way unredeemable except, I think, by landscape. You know, only, only landscape could uh, uh, redeem it in some way or other, you know, also ecologically, I think. And, um, but, you know, in terms of, um, I suppose the main issue about uh, landscape in relation to architecture, if by architecture one has in mind, you know, one-off works, then I think that what landscape, uh, um, you know, offers to the architect is the um, is the emphasis on the topography and the uh, the uh, layering or inscription of the of the building into the topography. I think that um, in order in order that it should not be one more aesthetic or not so aesthetic freestanding object. I mean, the, the problem is the proliferation, as I see it, the proliferation of freestanding objects that are not related to anything, not to each other, not to, and they're just endless proliferation of these objects, uh, which um, is a very depressing uh, uh, state of affairs, I think, and, and is you know, the megalopolis, basically. I mean, the journey from central London out to London City Airport is the megalopolis par excellence, you know, with all these different buildings that have nothing whatever to do with each other. 
And part of this is, arises because nobody has a project, nobody plans anything, you know? Total contempt for planning. It's no accident that the Ministry of Town and Country Planning changed its name to the Department of the Environment, I think, or something like that, right? That, that, that change of name even is, is, uh, is speaking about, uh, you know, this question of, or, or not speaking about the problem of uh, objects which are not, have no relationship to each other. In, indifferent in a way. And I think landscape then has this possibility of binding objects together and also binding the building into the site. Uh, I was interested in your um, re relationship with Caesar and the aphorism that you quoted. And he apparently, you said, wanted to be a sculptor and his buildings are both integrated with landscape and sculptural. When you're talking about project, do you think the problem comes uh, when, say, clients come with an expectation of a project, which in some ways has got a preformed thing that, uh, that this allows this connection back to a more rooted, emergent? I think last week you used the word embodiment or mm. emergence, which I was going to ask you to talk more about mm. that. Yeah, well, I, I uh, well, as the uh, Petar said, uh, I think at the table, you know, embody he started to react to the use of the term embodiment and about how that term can uh, have multiple meanings. And uh, so it, I think it, it's, um, well, anyway. I, I, I'm, not, I'm sure it does have more than one meaning, but uh, um, I, I suppose but maybe one way to get at this issue, which I think you are trying, well, I think there are two things that you raised. One is this question of the client and, and uh, in relation to what might be a project. And, and the fact that I think it, it is the case that many clients don't know what they want, you know. They, 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 or in any kind of detail, they don't know what they want, you know. And uh, so they sometimes fill in the gap, so to speak, by insisting on X or Y or Z, you know, factor. But uh, they, they, they have not thought it through. And, and part of the task of being an architect, I think, is to, to be able to you know, evolve with the client what the work should be. But the, the, the other part of your question is, is uh, I think, about experience, you know. And, um, and, and here, you know, I, I think, I, I, well, anyway, I would like to say, you know, I think that the tactile is just as important as the visual probably more important. And that the experience of the subject in architecture is, is very much tactile, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah. And that, 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 uh, that aspect is, uh, should be emphasized. And maybe there are connections to be made here between the building and the site, landscape, and the experience of the subject uh, in uh, in literally a tactile experience, or reading the environment as a as a tactile metaphor, you know, I think you know buildings and landscape can be um, read in uh, as as metaphorically as having a very strong tactile dimension. Thanks. Hi, Ken. Um, Hi. I I'm going to ask this question rather delicately, <laughs> uh, which is, um, you come from a long uh, and prestigious tradition that just so happens to be English, which is to do with architectural historians from Summerson to Rowe to Bannum and to yourself yeah. and many others. They just so happen to be British. They also happen to, many of them, end up living in the US. The question I'm asking is, 
from that tradition, there's a kind of largesse in which you're able to talk about many subjects in architecture, move around in many periods of time. You teach widely in terms of periodicity and geography. You're fascinated by all sorts of connections. And there is a, a, an intrinsic legitimacy, despite the fact there's a kind of uh, peripatetic quality to the way you, you move and think. Um, I'm wondering, asking for the future of the profession of the architectural historian and theorist, where do you think the pathways lie for the younger generation who uh, tend to be more, the, the pattern seems to be more in towards specializations in different fields and different areas of architecture, connections to urbanism, to landscape. But is there a place for this, this grand tradition to continue? And in what way do you see that tradition living? And what way does it have to mutate to be relevant today? Yeah. <laughs> yes, lovely. <laughs> no, no problem. All right. <laughs> yeah, uh, OK. Well, the question of relevance, I mean, um, it, it's, um, you know, how to make uh, this, this profession, uh, even a very broad interpretation of the profession, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the rivalry, let's say, between landscape architects and architects, or between architects, engineers, landscape architects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the question of the relevance of the profession, I mean, I think that that's, uh, I know that you are referring to historians and not to the profession, qua the profession, architecture. But, um, so, but I think the, the question of, um, of relevance and, and what is the, what is the uh, leading discourse of the moment? I think uh, is is a you know is a challenge for you know for historians and uh, for theorists and uh, architects uh, anybody. I mean, I think it's we live in a very difficult and challenging moment, and uh, um, and there are many kinds of subtexts. Which become, uh, which seem to take over an enormous amount of space. You know, uh, well, I'm 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 referring to particularly to the fact that I think there is a crisis in. Uh, well, anyway, I, I am talking about my direct experience of the Department of Architecture, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation in uh, in Colombia. You know, which I which from a distance, admittedly, I see as kind of in a rather critical state. And that, that critical state, I think, is partly to do with the fact that um, there's a lot of discourse which is um, loading up architecture with uh, things that it can't do anything about, you know. I mean, for example, racial justice, you know. Or, uh, you know, architecture can't, not capable of dealing with the issue of racial justice, I don't think. I mean, uh, because it is about, uh, it's a material culture. And, and also, with the term material culture, then, of course, architecture can also be uh, um, overwhelmed by the uh, ecological question, you know, that this field should somehow take care of the problem of the of a carbon footprint, you know. Uh, while we still have jet aircraft flying all over the world, you know, carbon footprint of which is just, you know, wild. And, and so I think, uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of not answering the question directly, I realize that, I'm, I'm kind of trying to skate around it, but um, I, I think the difficulty is, you know, for young people and and uh, in this field, you know, to to um, to build a discourse really which is relevant, you know, 
re relevant in terms of their own view of the world, but also relevant in relation to, um, you know, material. It is a material culture, after all. We are talking about material culture. Uh, and that, um, I mean, I, that's why I like so much this aphorism. Architects don't invent anything. They transform reality. It's, it's unbelievable, unbelievably profound, I think. And uh, then the discourse in relation to the reality, you know, what is real for us, for, for this field, for et cetera, et cetera, you know. That, those, I, I think, you know, the challenge is for young people to be able to, you know, formulate their question and, and, and stay with it also, you know. It can't have a, uh, you know, immediate answer. It has to be lived out in a way. Um, do you think building a bit more tactile and with more embodied cognition, can that help with globalization and um, how we sort of consume um, urban form? Yeah, well, the last part of your question, consume, is uh, fundamental, I think, you know, because you actually said that, consume urban form. That's already, I mean, one knows where it's coming from, you know, because of the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not challenging you about it. I mean, I understand the use of the term, but it's also the world we live in. I mean, you know, the, you know we, there is so much um, information that encourages us to reduce the whole world to consumption, really, to, you know. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I don't really know how to answer the question, to be honest. Um, but I think the, the fact that you use the word, the phrase, consume urban form, uh, but you also said, and that is, that's the, the full question if I get it finally, is this question of the tactile, which, which involves experience. You know, and, and, and this question of what is the experience of subject. You know. And uh, so I think that and here, of course, you know, I'm kind of close to this whole phenomenological issue. Uh, I'm close to Pal yeah, I don't know if you know the writings of Johanny Palasma, but I'm very close to Johanny Palasma, you know. Um, yeah. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up. Yeah. I wanted to thank both of you for hopefully the middle of a conversation because it's been an absolute delight to have you here so often and I hope you keep coming. We had a good conversation last week. I like to think that we could do this almost on a weekly basis and the conversation keeps growing. Um, we're going to adjourn upstairs to the bar um, where you can all get a copy of the book, perhaps even sign a few and, uh, and continue the conversations in a more informal manner. But thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Kenneth. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.